They could make these stones float if they wanted them to. They could make this rock float. Even this Sherman tank could be made to float. The question is, how? The upward force exerted on a solid object immersed in water is equal to the weight of the volume of water displaced by the object. If this force is greater than the weight of the object, that is, if the object possesses less density than the water, the object will float with more or less of its bulk projecting above the surface. If, on the other hand, the weight of the object is greater than the weight of the water displaced, the object will sink to the bottom. By increasing the volume of the water displaced, however, by building projecting walls on the object, and hence increasing the upward force, even the heaviest object may be made to float. And that's the principle by which the Sherman can be made to float. A canvas screen is fitted onto it to give it the necessary buoyancy. To carry this screen and to get volume, a false prow and all-round decking are built onto the tank above the tracks. The screen frame consists of pillars inflated by an air compressor driven by the engine. These pillars are attached to the false prow and decking. Stiffening rails are in turn secured to the pillars and also struts secured to the tank hull. Canvas is fitted to this framework. While waterborne, the tank is propelled and steered by two propellers driven through the rear idlers. The screen is collapsible. It's raised by the air pillars and deflated by hydraulic means which also break the struts. The following sequences are carried out under training conditions and will vary according to weather and ops. When the tanks are used in a sea operation, they are loaded onto a landing craft from which they are launched at sea at a given rendezvous. Loading is done in reverse, with the tank commander facing the landing craft so that he's in visual contact with the loading officer. Special care must be taken to avoid damage to the flotation gear. When the craft is loaded, the ramp doors are closed. The standard mulock extensions remain fitted to the ramp and are packed up to the same plane as the ramp which itself is not long enough to be used as a launching platform for the Sherman DD tank. If the extensions were not packed up, the bow of the tank would drop too steeply when entering the water. Half an hour before the rendezvous is reached, the tank crews start preparations for launching and carry out a drill to check over the equipment. The propellers are checked for lowering and raising, and at the same time the hydraulic steering gear is tested from port to starboard. The waterproofing is also inspected. When the final checkup of all equipment has been completed, the engine is started to raise the screen. During the inflation, which takes about 15 minutes, the crew fit on their amphibious tank escape apparatus. Each man then reports to the launching officer who inflates the escape apparatus with oxygen.
When the screens are fully raised and struts made, inspection is carried out by the crew to see if any tears or damage have been sustained during loading. Repairs can be made on board. The deck steering levers and the driver's and commander's periscopes are now placed in position. The landing craft has now reached its rendezvous. It should have its stern to the wind so as to give as much protection as possible to the tanks as they enter the water. The ramp is lowered to the limit of the preventer chains. These are checked by the launching officer who sees that they are fully extended because they must take the whole weight of the ramp, the lowering cables acting as an additional safety measure. He also makes sure that the ramp is at an angle between 18 and 24 degrees to the deck with the hinge pins flush with the water. The position of the ramp is of the highest importance for safe launching and it is the responsibility of the launching officer. The readiness of the craft for launching the tanks is the responsibility of the senior naval officer who can stop the launching if at any time he considers his craft is being endangered. The whole time he keeps in visual contact with the launching officer who stands on the starboard winch house so that he can be in contact with each tank commander. The tanks are put into first gear when they're launched with their propellers raised and on no account must the steering gear be touched while they are going down the ramp. The total weight of the Sherman tank is 34 tons. Immediately the tank is waterborne, the commander orders the driver to lower the propellers and engage third gear. If any water is shipped or seeps inside the screen or hull, it's cleared out by a bilge pump. The entire tank is below the waterline, which is approximately level with the top of the turret. As she goes along, the tracks revolve in order to drive the propellers. She is steered by the commander using the deck steering lever, but if enemy action forces him to close down, the driver steers with the aid of his periscope or by directional gyro. Or, as the commander also has a periscope, he can give instructions to the driver. In water, the Sherman can travel at 4.24 knots and her fuel consumption is 25.26 gallons per hour. Small arms fire has little effect on the flotation, but a near miss by HE may damage the canvas below the waterline. However, unless the screen is badly torn, the bilge pump can deal with the incoming water. As the first three tanks touch bottom and come up to the beach, they may take up a hull down position in the water by deflating their screens to the half drop at the rear. This prevents the following sea from swamping the engine and the armament is now ready to engage any target. The remaining tanks come ashore and go into the full drop position. Once the tanks have beached, they take up their normal role of fighting vehicles. Their performance and manoeuvrability on dry land is not affected by the fact that they've swum ashore under their own power. When the Sherman 3 DD Mark II is used for river crossing, and the approach is known to be thick scrub and undergrowth, additional equipment exists to give protection to the canvas screen in its deflated position. It also gives the screen some protection against small arms fire. This equipment is known as topi. It's a six millimeter metal shield completely surrounding the sides and top of the screen and consists of hinged plates which are folded outwards before the screen can be raised.
plates are then pegged back. Topi equipment must be fitted in a base workshop. It is not a field operation. The equipment in no way affects the seaworthiness or performance of the tank. Therefore, when the screen is raised, the tank is ready to become waterborne and advances to the river bank. Navigating a tank in a fast-flowing river is more difficult than handling one in the sea. In a river, currents vary at different depths and places, and if, as in this case, the current is flowing at three knots and the maximum speed of the DD is 4.24 knots, the tank has small advantage over the current and will soon drift unless she is correctly handled and the necessary allowances are made to enable her to land at a given point. Navigating a waterborne tank is a very different matter from navigating a boat. The rudder of the boat relies for its steering effect on the forward motion of the craft itself. It is a deflector working by the pressure exerted on its projected area as the craft moves through the water. Without movement of the craft there can be no steering effect. The steering propeller, on the other hand, is a positive force pushing the tail of the DD, so it acts regardless of whether there's forward movement. If the propeller is set at an angle, it'll push the tail round and the DD tends to pivot on its bow onto the fresh course. This happens whether it's moving forward or not. Crossing a river with the DD is a ticklish procedure. It's usual to cross at an angle with the current if it's fast. Or possibly against the current if it's slow. In either case, the difficulty occurs on landing at the far bank. It must be remembered that the tracks are in motion at the same time as the propellers. In the diagram, the tank is approaching at an angle with the stream. The left-hand track touches the bank first. As its traction is greater than the push of the propellers, it will simply steer the DD round and back into the water. To counteract this, then, Immediately the track grounds, the propellers must be turned to assist the stream to swing the tail round so that the outer track may also grip the bank. When approaching at an angle against the current, the propellers must be turned to work against the stream to get the DD square on. From this it can be seen that the tank could not carry out this maneuver in a swiftly flowing stream.
correctly navigated tank should be able to land on the enemy bank at a given point 25 feet wide. This tank is being handled by a fully trained crew. By watching the river banks in the background, it can be seen that the tank is tending continuously to change course owing to the flow of the river. So the commander must be very quick to check these tendencies to swing and to keep the tank on its predetermined course. Finally, the tank touches down exactly at its scheduled landing place. The river bank at this point is firm, but sometimes it may be necessary to make a landing in very soft mud into which the tank would sink. One way of overcoming the mud is to lay down a coir, tube and rail mat over which the tank can pass. Twenty DD tanks can be landed over one of these mats. The crew of a Sherman DD tank all wear the amphibious tank escape apparatus in case the tank is sunk. They can then breathe underwater surface and remain afloat. The apparatus provides a supply of pure oxygen instead of normal air and absorbs the exhaled carbon dioxide through a chemical filter containing protosorb. The breathing bag is first fitted with an oxidant, a small cylinder holding oxygen under pressure. The neck of the cylinder can be broken in an emergency to give an additional supply of oxygen. but the main supply is provided by initial inflation from an oxygen cylinder immediately after the wearer has strapped on the apparatus. In action, this initial inflation is carried out by the launching officer on the landing craft. The total supply of oxygen enables a man to breathe underwater for seven minutes and still have enough buoyancy to come to the surface and float. The apparatus is strapped to the chest. To breathe through it, a rubber mouthpiece is inserted into the mouth, and the nose closed by a clip. The oxygen is admitted through a cock on the mouthpiece. The wearer then breathes from the bag and back into it via the chemical filter so that he's always breathing pure oxygen. In training tank crews to use the apparatus, considerable practice is given in breathing underwater and surfacing until they have complete confidence. In the first practical stage, the student submerges his breathing bag to accustom himself to the water pressure against it when breathing. He then submerges the mouthpiece to ensure that he's not losing oxygen by incorrect breathing. He must purse his lips tightly on the mouthpiece. Then, to make certain that he's breathing in and out through his mouth, he goes down a little further so that his nose is underwater. Finally, he goes under completely so as to get the feel of all-round pressure underwater. When there's no doubt that he's breathing correctly, he's sent down to the bottom.
Down there, he may suffer from pressure on his eardrums. If so, he squeezes the breathing tube, holds his nose and blows. The pressure is then relieved. He then walks across the bottom and climbs out the other side. The next phase is surfacing drill. When the student reaches the bottom, he stands to attention and comes up. He breaks surface with his head and shoulders braced well back, feet crossed and hands behind him. When he's settled in the water, he brings his hands very slowly up to the mouthpiece cock, empties his lungs into the breathing bag and closes the cock. He then takes off his nose clip, fills his lungs with air through his nose and breathes into the bag by opening and shutting the cock. He now has additional buoyancy and removes his mouthpiece. After students have mastered underwater breathing and surfacing drill, they make an escape from a submerged Valentine tank. The instructor acts as safety man during training escapes. They take up their crew positions with their equipment at the ready. As the tank is flooded, they fit on the apparatus. At a given signal from the instructor, the crew leave the tank and carry out surfacing drill. The crew then make an escape from a Sherman. Their normal positions in the tank 
are such that it's necessary for the commander, turret gunner and wireless operator to escape in that order. Before the commander leaves, he taps the gunner to let him know, and the gunner in turn taps the wireless operator. The driver and hull gunner escape independently. If it's necessary to float for a long period before being picked up, further buoyancy can be obtained by inserting the mouthpiece and breathing into the bag to blow it up again fully. So long as the breathing bag is fully inflated, the wearer can remain afloat indefinitely, even though he can't swim.